we actually, this was long ago enough that we had to explain to people that the web was social. We we're like, you know when you send email? That's social. <laughs> You're being social online. So that was sort of a, an unexpected thing. And then Wikipedia. And nobody had ever visualized Wikipedia before. So we were very interested. Is there anything um, that could be visualized that would make sense visually here? How are these people coming together and creating these um, incredible articles um, just openly? <clears throat> and then history flow. And history flow was was a visualization of how a single article um, evolves over time and how many people touch it and what they change and what happens. Um, and just by doing that visualization, we were able to uncover patterns and measure patterns that had not been measured before, that people didn't being able to just, it's sort of like you, you create this lens through which you're looking at this, the social dynamics um, that you just couldn't see before. So it's, it's, it was quite exciting for us. What were the questions? We were interested in understanding how people were working together on Wikipedia to create these very sophisticated articles. And we were interested in um, patterns of collaboration. So for instance, were people fighting? And if they were fighting, how were they resolving their fights? Um, how were people deciding what piece of content um, belonged in a certain page or in a different page? So for instance, I can, I can again, this was back in 2003, you had to explain to people what wikis were, how they worked, and the fact that Wikipedia was being created by, you know, a multitude of, of authors. So this visualization made these things very, very clear. Um, how many people... One of the things that is so captivating about uh, visualizing complex data is that um, sight is our, the, the sense for which we have the highest bandwidth which means that we can take so much information just by looking at it. We're very good at, um, forget data, just looking at the world, we're very good at understanding complex patterns. We, we're, we're very good at, you know, looking at something very focusedly and then realizing that things are moving around you in the periphery. We're good at that. Uh, we do cognition, yes, where you can look at a picture and, Im and immediately um, you understand what's background and what's foreground, what jumps at you. Um, that's very complex. It doesn't sound complex, but it's not trivial. And we do it immediately. So one of the things that we, we get with data visualization is that we are able to show highly complex data in ways that look almost natural or intuitive. In a sense, we're sort of playing these tricks uh, with our brain. We're just sort of speaking the language of, of of the brain in a sense. So for instance, and if you think about it, um, for many, many years, there have been standard ways of visualizing wind. We are surrounded by wind maps that are very standard, uh, official wind maps. Um, and usually the way they are presented to us, it's as static images with a vector field, right? So you have like little arrows that sort of tell you the direction of the wind and the length of the arrow usually tells you the speed of the wind. And those work beautifully, um, except that you need to work very hard to look at an entire map of the country and say, oh, okay, I can sort of see this major pattern going north. And then over here, if I look, these arrows are going that way and then pointing down and then, okay. But like you said, you, you don't get the gestalt. Once we... Once we did the visualization where everything is moving, the wind is moving, you immediately get this notion of, wow, there is a big current going north, but here in the Rockies, everything is messy. It's like going everywhere, but it's also slow. You understand these things at the same time. Um, it is complex data, but it doesn't seem that con complex when you, when you just show it visually. And so is... There has been a lot of t a lot of talk about simplicity and making things simple, which I'm a big fan of when when things are simple. But if you are dealing with complex data, um, rich textured data, it can 
sometimes be detrimental if you simplify too much the way you're visualizing the data. Um, a lot of times just by, by adding complexity and, and, and texture and depth to your data, you create a much richer image that is easier for people to understand. Again, it's the, so it's sort of an unintuitive leap of faith that complexity can actually help um, make things easier to understand. But I think if done right, uh, complexity is, is very important to understanding the kinds of, um, of data that we deal with a lot of times. Um, one kind of complex data that people love to look at is social network data. Um, who is talking to whom, who is friends with whom. Um, and the first thing that people will try um, when um, they first visualize social networks is to do a node link diagram, right? And more often than not, we end up with hairballs, right? And that to me <laughs> is, 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 is really sad because hairballs do not help you understand how a social network works or who's connected to whom. Maybe the maximum you can get is, oh, there's a huge cluster here, and it's sort of related to this other huge cluster here. But that's not enough. So to me, that is a limitation, not necessarily in terms of the complexity of the data. I think the data is extremely interesting in its complexity. It's a limitation of the choice of technique for visualizing that data. So for instance, uh, Another visualization we did, Google Plus Ripples, we were confronted exactly with that question. How do you show um, how things go viral on a social network? Um, and we chose to show, okay, if you have a URL that everybody's sharing and talking about, how do you show the, the path, the flow of this URL? And the first thing we thought about was, can we visualize this as a tree? I share it with you, you shared with your friends, your friends shared, that's a tree. Okay, let's do that. Um, didn't work, obviously, because uh, these things have exponential growth and so the tree had a huge breadth and you could not, um, you couldn't read any of the labels. So you couldn't see who was sharing things with whom. Now we could have continued with that visualization and said, well, that's what it looks like. That's the spread, that's something going viral. But we weren't happy with that. We decided, no, you have to be able to read people's names. So, so tons of work went into creating a visualization that at a glance gives you a sense of the big influencers in the space. But then as soon as you start navigating the visualization, you get a sense of everybody. You really see, okay, this is a conversation that's happening in this community. This is how they're sharing this uh, content. But this other community here is also sharing and talking about it in a different way. So that was part of the work we put in was to make the visualization legible. So I think it can uh, something that has been a constant interest of mine in, in visualization has always been this relationship between macro trends and micro. So you, you want to see the, over, the overall picture. You want to get that bird's eye view and see, wow, things you couldn't see before. But then I'm always also interested in diving down to the data and understanding the, the very individual pieces of the data set. And I think a lot of times good visualizations will allow you to do that. They will allow you to go, you know, sort of zoom out uh, to see the overview, this, to see the overall picture, but then very quickly dive in. So, um, and, and back then the only thing that existed for visualizing text were word clouds, which are fine. You know, they, they're a good way to get a, to get a sense of the most frequently um, mentioned words in a piece of text, they have a big problem, which is they decontextualize everything. So the fact th there are so many data sets that will allow you to peer into what's happening. I mean, you talk about Twitter, right? And it's, if you can visualize Twitter, you, you, it's almost like you're taking the pulse of, of what's happening. Um, one of the things, for instance, we just launched a, um, 
a new real-time visualization, uh, which sort of gives me that sense of <laughs> peering in what people are thinking, or at least paying attention to, which is the YouTube trends map. So it shows viral videos on YouTube um, all over the US per region. Um, as the map, there were these videos that would just like stick and they would sweep the country in in a couple of days. And then in a couple of days they would be gone. And it's it's just like this collective gaze into, into what is capturing people's minds at the moment. Um, um, by looking at this live data set, it also showed me um, how much ahead of us the 13-year-olds are. It's, there are these trends where 13-year-olds will start watching a video, and then a couple of days later, you can count on it. The entire, the entire country is going to be um, you know, watching the same thing. So it's like they're leading us. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's, one of the things about sentiment analysis is that you can tell how excited people are, but it's really hard to tell if it's positive or negative. So um, one of the things that we started noticing are the different patterns of vi virality. Um, so for instance, we have this pattern, which we call a celebrity pattern, which happens whenever you have some quasi-celebrity or celebrity uh, post something, and then immediately the followers will reshare on Google+. And so it's, it's almost like fireworks. Shh, it happens, and then it's gone. It's a very, uh, the, the breadth of, of the, of the um, sharing is, is huge, but there's no depth. It stops there. It's very different. It stops there. It's very different than, say, a news story. When a news story breaks, so for instance, some uh, article in the New York Times that goes viral or something, um, you have these really intricate um, networks of how people are sharing. And those tend to be very deep and they span different communities. And so the conversations change. There are very different conversations that happen around the same piece, the same article. Um, so it's, it's almost like you were replaying this moment of discovery. And so that is the response I hope our visualizations evoke on people. It's discovering new information or new patterns that you didn't even know existed that are out there. Um, and hopefully also understanding that complex data is something you don't have to be afraid of, that, you, that is something you can understand and you can interact with. Social um, data, I am always interested in, in social dynamics and whether or not visualization can help shed a light. Um, so I'm very curious about um, you know, data sets that are being generated every day uh, online. Um, I'm interested in people's conversations. I'm interested in, in exchanges of that kind. Um, I think over these last 10 years, it's really become much more of a mainstream discipline which is incredibly exciting because you know you have journalists, you have artists, you you have all sorts of, of uh, folks coming from different backgrounds who are going to contribute different pieces to what data visualization can be and should be. And so, the work that Martin and I do sort of spans, uh, you know, all the way from science to art, and I think that's. Partly why we like to do it so much is because we have all these questions that we try to answer in different ways. Um, um, I think the notion of being hybrid or, or of the community being hybrid is an, a very important one uh, because I think we're all trying to figure out what this means and trying to make room for each other, uh, which to me is, is just incredibly exciting. Um, I, on an everyday basis, on a, on a very concrete basis, for instance, um, I get very excited when you know, I look at the New York Times and I see the amazing strides they're making and just the fact that they're not afraid of like, exposing their readers to really sophisticated visualization techniques. Uh, visualization techniques that came from academia and that only experts would touch now are things that, you know, 
readers in general have access to and can play with. Um, so I can think, and which is all of a sudden, regular people are interacting with hundreds, if not thousands of numbers at the same time. And that is powerful. That changes the way you think about visualization. Um, it also hopefully enhances the level of literacy and data literacy that we have as a, as a society. And, and I think that is something that uh, we really need going forward. We need to have, you know, uh, we need to be data literate as a society, not only at the level of experts or policymakers, but you really need to have this as a mainstream sort of technology uh, where more and more people come in contact with the actual figures of, you know, how things are decided upon, um, how money is spent, whatever it is. Um, um, and also so that regular people understand that more and more of their lives is being captured as data. So the conversations you have on Facebook or, you know, the pictures you exchange, all of that is data and, and it belongs to them too. And they could visualize and they could understand more about the archives they have. For instance, one of, one of the things I spent many years being obsessed about was visualizing um, email archives. And I need to take a screenshot and, you know, people would bring someone else and sit in front of the computer and be like, do you remember this is when we started dating and this is when we broke up? And I was like, whoa, what about privacy? They're like, no, this is my story. This is my, this is my life. I want to share it. So I'm, I'm, the question I'm interested in there is what can we do uh, with our data? I, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, you have a... Uh, the the um, self-quantification of data is, is an interesting movement to me because I think it's partly what I would like to see where you're, you're taking ownership of your data and you're actually using that for your own ends. So you, you have to ease, I feel like <laughs> visualizing numbers at this point sort of solved in a sense. We have so many different ways of visualizing tables of numbers. Um, obviously, I'm sure there are more techniques that will be created and will make things even better. I think one big unexplored area is how do we visualize things that are not numbers? So text, images, videos, which in fact turn out to be a significant portion of the tons of data that we're generating every day. Um, and in the more artistic work that we do, we're always interested in pushing the boundaries of what, what do we mean by data, even. Uh, for instance, uh, sensuality, it's something that is so fleeting, it's so subjective. Can you capture that? How, and if you can capture that, how would you visualize it? So, for instance, we, we had a project there where we were interested in touch. We're like, how do you even quantify touch? So, so... We thought, okay, so if you think about it in terms of lovers and where lovers would like to touch each other or be touched, does that, is that different for men and women? How would we find out? So we decided to actually go on Mechanical Turk. And we had a, a, an interface we designed specifically for this where we prompted people to look at different areas of the body. And, you know, they would tell us, uh, I'm interested in men, I'm interested in women, um, you know, and, and we would prompt them for, uh, to rate different parts of the, of the body for touch. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because we were expecting all sorts of, all sorts of fetishes to come up in the data, and they didn't. And, um, but we did find unintuitive things. So for instance, uh, we had a map of the front and the back of the body for both men and women. And on the women, the by far the most highly rated part of the body to be that they wanted to be touched on was the nape. And their lovers completely missed that. So you have the two maps. You have the map of where women would like to be touched and where the lovers would like to touch them, and they don't match. And so it's like... And what is data? How do you define data? And how do you capture things that you wouldn't even think of as data necessarily? So that was 
a lot of times we'll start with some kind of question or something we are curious about. A lot of times we will not have a very specific question. We'll just have like a general curiosity. We're like sort of